Good morning, everybody. This is Ng, and uh, we are going to be bringing in my friend Phil Tanari pretty soon for um, the next version of uh, Praise You, my chats with wonderful creative people from literally around the world. Um, thank you, Internet. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you in here. Um, I am going to bring Phil in in a second. just want to say I ordered this book and it came the other day. I don't know you guys are seeing it backwards, but I love Thich Nhat Hanh. If you, any of you need something beautiful, full of mindfulness, um, this is a book called Fear, Essential Wisdom for Getting Through the Storm. He has another book that really pulled me through some tough times a couple years ago called True Love. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a Zen Buddhist monk and uh, amazing. Um, all right, we're going to talk to Phil really soon, and um, first of all, tell me where you're coming from. Um, by the way, a lot of you have remarked on my cat. This is a tissue box holder, and um, since this is a radiator, I needed something decorative on it to look fun, and um, I put that there. I don't own a cat. I own a dog. Um, but all right, Phil, that's where Phil requests to join me. And um, then we'll put you on. I'll, I'll see if I can get you on. Uh, let's see. Good morning, Susan Chen. Good morning, everybody. And tell me also where you're calling from, too. <laughs> hey, Bill. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Can you, um, can you speak up a little bit? You're a little fuzzy. Yeah, sure. I, I have... Earbuds, is it? Uh, I can try. That's fine, I think. Yeah. Can you guys hear him okay? Okay. Hi, Paul. Yeah. What's uh, up? How is life? Uh, Beijing, man. It's uh, it's the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> um, <laughs> after okay. I, I, sorry, you will need to elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah, everyone here is feeling fine. Maybe I need to turn up my volume. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. Um, so, uh, Phil, Philip Tanari is, um, <laughs> I know him as Phil and, uh, I, you know, I will, uh, it's the, the written Philip is, is how, um, we refer to him. Um, but he is the wonderful director of the UCCA Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing. And, uh, we have known each other a really, really long time. Although I think you knew my husband first, um, because, I don't think we took classes together in college. I, no, I, so I knew Devin because I feel like I remember being a freshman and he was a senior and he was the editor of the Duke Chronicle. Yeah. And, you know, when you're like at that age, having a byline every day in the campus newspaper is kind of like the most famous you can be. I mean, this is before yeah. social media, right? So. Well, except if you're a Duke uh, basketball player. Well, that's, yeah, there are always, everything's relative, I suppose. Yeah, yo yo wait, yo yo was like, wait, what? We went to college together. We we technically did, but I don't see I transferred into Duke. So I was right. only there for two years and I like I didn't really hang out with anyone. <laughs> yeah, well I um, yeah, I didn't really either. I sort of went to China. Um which is yeah. sort of like the opposite and, of hanging out with people. And you studied Chinese like Chinese language. That was your major, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I was in the uh, the literature program, which was kind okay. of like Marxist post-colonial theory stuff with Fred Jameson uh -huh. and Michael Hart and those people. And yeah. they were very encouraging of and forgiving of, you know, this idea of studying yeah. non-Western language. And the, yeah. the department at that time is before the Nasher was built. So the department was in what was the Duke Museum. Um, right. And the Duke Museum had this amazing, like, Duma, it was called that, had a student curated kind of program. And so I curated a show and it was a Chinese. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, and you worked with Xu Bing. That was your big thing. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, he was, it was kind of this miraculous thing where, like, he was, um, he happened to come to campus to work on the tobacco project the semester I came back from being in China, and it was, like, they sent me to pick him up at the airport, and, uh, yeah, it yeah. was contemporary art. It was the sort of sum of everything yeah. I was interested in. That was, it. That was a big was point that. of all of that. Yeah. Phil, can you just like move your camera a little bit so your head is higher up in the frame? Because sure. you're going to get blown for a lot of the comments. <laughs> yeah, that's better. You look okay. great. 
Um, okay, so it is 9 p.m. in Beijing. So I really appreciate mm. you spending your late night here with me. Um, and uh, I also haven't seen you in a few months. I saw you in Beijing over the summer and you guys had that beautiful gala benefit. And I was so immensely impressed by all of the work that you and your team have done. Um, and then it changed a lot over the last few months. Can you tell us about what happened? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, for me, the whole thing began. Um, I was in Davos, actually, it's sort of embarrassing, but mm. um, and got um, word that um, actually, like, our the driver from UCCA was trying to go from Beijing to Shenzhen. You know, it was just twenty one hundred kilometers the other side of the country um, for the Chinese New Year because the you know everybody was kind of in holiday mode. The Chinese New Year. Uh, holiday basically yeah. on the 24th of january yeah. so this is the 22nd um remember like this is the day that trump got up after his speech there and said you know it's one person from china it's no big deal um and and you know they're from china we're getting like text messages from from this driver colleague of ours saying that he couldn't make it from beijing to shenzhen because they closed the border of hubei province and that was when mm. we were like, oh, okay, this is this is mm. something extremely serious. Um, yeah, I was actually in China in 2003 during SARS, and in fact, spent that period as a news assistant, a uh, temporary news assistant for the New York Times um, mm. in the Beijing bureau. So you know, it was like running around to find the civet cat that you know they thought it came from, and with the, with yeah. the correspondence, you know, like chasing down cases and hospitals and things like that so yeah i had like yeah. a pretty you know coherent frame of reference for what an epidemic or a massive public health incident mm -hmm. looks like in china mm -hmm. um but i i mean i think it was uh, so I, we were on the, i was on the road for three weeks from like the 19th of january to the 11th of february and just watching it kind mm -hmm. of progressively spiral um you know the big turning point another big turning point in china was february 7th when the doctor li wenliang died um, this is a 30 right. something doctor who'd been one of the original whistleblowers. And I think right. that was, you know, it was a major um, kind of collective trauma, if you will. And then I, yeah. I sort of struggled with whether to go back um, or to go somewhere else. And in the end, I decided my last stop on the trip was Cape Town for this uh, Rolex mm. Arts weekend. And I, I ended up just, I mean, the flight from Hong Kong into China was delayed, but so I ended up you know, spending a day in the Hong Kong airport, but kind of getting back to China, mm -hmm. uh, to Beijing mm -hmm. on the 11th. And um, I've been here since, which is, I think, in all these years of living here, I've never as long spent as you stay put. 70 yeah. days without going to another city. Um, and, you yeah. know, you can't go to another city because if you go to another city, your code will go red. Um, so, right, tell everybody what, what that means. Yeah, so, you know, um, people's have a different relationship with, um, you know, surveillance uh, on and offline, right, as we know. Um, and and also with just a lot of the sort of social rituals and protocols around how one yeah. would deal with something like this. So, like, mask wearing. Hey, Bobby. Yeah. Robert, sorry. Robert Kelly just joined. Oh, there he is. What's That's up? How we <laughs> I know, oh, an old friend house. from Tim. Um, those of you who are joining, because there's so many people, and there's Devin, there's my husband, uh, people who are joining, this is Philip Tenari from Beijing uh, at the UCCA Contemporary Arts Center. He's, te he's telling us about um, life right now under COVID-19. All right, go for it, Phil. Yeah, so um, where were we? I mean, oh, so basically, you know, people wear masks the only people who don't wear masks are a few like extremely flippant foreigners who end up in incidents um you you wear a mask uh -huh. like if you leave your apartment um right we you wear one in the office i mean because we're back to work if you're in any public space okay. like when i'm in my room I, my, by myself i might take it off but um uh -huh. yeah it's sort uh -huh. of just de facto so it's been um the biggest adjustment for me has been contact lenses because, you know, when you're wearing like regular glasses, they fog up mm -hmm. with the mask. Yeah. Especially and the you winter. were talking about the code. You were talking about the code. Yeah. Is that, yeah. um, is that yeah, on so, your WeChat? So the way it works, I mean, there's actually two systems. One of them I actually mm -hmm. haven't really cracked because it's tied to your um, Chinese ID code number, which I, I don't have because um, I'm you know not 
natural born um, and, and, and to facial recognition and is actually a much more complex system. But the, the one that seems to be in kind of very common use at the entrances to a lot of restaurants and hotels and uh, other kinds of public spaces, um, essentially just you, you scan one of, there's a sort of little paper with three QR codes. You scan the one that uh, connects to your mobile carrier, China, you know, China mobile, China Unicom or whatever the other one is. And um, it it basically pushes a, a six digit code verification code. You know, it's like two step authentication to your phone. Uh, you enter it, and then it basically quickly searches your all your cell phone pings and shows that you've mm-hmm. only been in Beijing for the last fourteen days. You know, a sort of one incubation wow. period, and you get this. So free. whenever you enter, whenever you enter a store or restaurant, uh, any sort of space like that, you they. They scan your code. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously like gradations of this. Um, okay. I live in a in a in a compound that's kind of, it's, it's a diplomatic compound that's kind of always had fairly tight security. So, um, mm-hmm. what's really de facto is just like a temperature scan with one of those. Um, so where I like when I enter the compound, I'll get my temperature taken, but um, I don't have mm-hmm. to show a code to do that. But um, mm, yeah. yeah, like serious, I mean, places that take it more seriously will, and then there are people yeah. who just kind of are, you know, have some sheeting or supposed to write something down and no one does that happens to, but, um, you know, restaurants are open again, but they're at kind of half capacity offices are open again, but are theoretically at half capacity. Although most companies want people back at work, um, yeah. schools are going to reopen. I think they're going to start with this, the sort of high school seniors who need to take their college entrance exam this summer yeah and then kind yeah. of work backwards from that okay. um and, and museums are reopening we're reopening on may 21st which yeah so talk, really talk to us cool. about talk to us about your museum um as the director you know and you since you were actually traveling globally you were kind of seeing this from afar like right before the lockdown um in your mind and in your team's kind of process what was that like so, you know, it was just timing wise, it was interesting because Chinese New Year is such a major um, moment in the calendar. Uh, mm-hmm. You sort of assume a two or three week essentially shut down regardless, yeah. because it's the only right. time of the year that people, you know, stop working. I mean, the official holiday is eight or nine days, but people tend to take accumulated leave of different kinds. And so you mm-hmm. basically from a week before to three weeks later, you know, don't plan on getting any, anything major done. Um, right. So the fact that it sort of hit right then um, was sort of interesting because you weren't going from full volume to nothing overnight. You were actually just suspending the resumption of normal uh-huh. uh, indefinitely. Mm-hmm. So it was very easy to say, like, no, we won't actually go back to work on February 3rd. We'll go, you know, everything yeah. will stop for one more week to February 10th and then to push that back yeah. another week and then to start thinking. So I, I don't know, it's maybe something people haven't remarked on that much, but like just in terms of how you orchestrate a major um, lockdown, it, 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 it sort of makes sense. Also people are back at their, a lot of people are back at their homes, you know, their legal places right. of residence, you know, in China, there's right. a whole household right. registration system and this whole right. thing of people coming back, especially because Beijing is more sensitive than anywhere else. Um, so coming mm-hmm. back to the capital mm-hmm. is harder than, you know, going back to another city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think, yeah. you know, I think it, it's but but the, the crazy thing actually to me is that, you know, for it having originated in China and regardless of what you think about the, the numbers, because I don't think there are very many people who think, you know, that only 3000 people died here um, tragically. Um, mm. Nonetheless, you know, I don't know anyone personally who's had it here or let alone really? died, died from it. Yeah. I mean, it was extremely wow. contained. To Hubei, yeah, which is just like to think of how many people one knows or knows of everywhere else. It's yeah. kind of, yeah, it's. it's well, I mean, true. you know, we're. Gonna, I'm speaking to, and I knew someone whose brother, uh, in fact, died from it on week one of the lockdown. Wow. And yeah, and uh, and we're speaking with Duke Riley at twelve o'clock. Um, he's recovered from it. So, you know, in just New York alone, I feel like it hit me right away on a personal level, which was devastating. But for you, I mean, I think a lot of Americans had this assumption that it was so bad in China and it could, you know, that's China. It's not how it's going to be here. 
Um, but obviously it's, you know, the numbers are already way worse. So that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did you plan in terms of having the museum be prepared for something like this? We, um, we, we started working very quickly with, you know, so there are there are uh, seven nine eight has a kind of what we a management committee, which is essentially like the government's embassy inside seven nine eight, and and of course so they're like our immediate vehicle for you know the latest policies. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we're in we're in daily, if, weekly if not daily contact with them, sort of regardless. Okay. And then kind of okay. internally, um, because we you know corporate wise are we're majority owned by a particular. Um, conglomerate essentially with, who have policies across their different companies, which are in totally different sectors, but there is a kind of central apparatus there to, to think about, you know, the, the sorts of compliance and public health things you need to, yeah. to just keep everybody safe. Yeah. And, it, you know, even today, I mean, we have a, a epidemic control WeChat group of, you know, people in our senior management and every single day, like actually just a few minutes ago, Security will send through uh, uh, just screenshots, not screenshots, but photos of the uh, of the of the employee, you know, entrance register mm-hmm. from the from the door. So just to, uh, so mm-hmm. people understand, I mean, the museum, the galleries are totally closed, but the building in which our offices sit is is there's one open entrance. So we all, you know, we come in and out, but we don't. Um, okay. We're not yet. We're not yet. You know, most people are most people are, are working from home. It sounds like, but you guys are able to go into the space for work if you need to yeah no i actually think most people are back to work in beijing at least okay um and, and we're uh-huh. mo- we're pretty much back to work i mean we have a sort of we have a rotation system where we're encouraging people to use accumulated overtime and things just trying to mm-hmm. um you know mm-hmm. understand how what it means to be where i i'd say I mean, actually, from the last 10 days or so, it feels like we're back at almost 100 percent. But then you think about wow. you know, all the things that didn't happen. I mean, you know, we're busy again. But then you think about how crazy it would have been if, you know, our puzzle Hong Kong had happened, if we would opened three shows already, you know, if we'd had however many right. events and programs we would have had. So it's. Yeah. Again, yeah. It's so what are you doing in terms of, um, you know, rescheduling programs and events that may have been canceled? because of this. Oh, I think we have a delay on Phil. Oh, hey, can you hear me okay? I'm back, I'm back. Okay. I I know I heard what did you and then I didn't hear the rest. Oh, um, I was saying what what are your plans for rescheduling or programming that, you know, due to everything that was canceled? Yeah, so... So we should have opened a show called Immaterial Rematerial, A Brief History of Computing Art, um, curated Mm -hmm. by Jerome Dutch, the former director of the Grand Palais in Paris, um, which is kind of looking at algorithmic and generative tendencies in contemporary art going back to the to the 60s, actually. Um, so mm-hmm. actually, most of the work had arrived for that show. Our Matthew Barney show ended, which was essentially the show that was at Yale, and that's going to the Hayward at some point yeah. um, on January 12th. Yeah. And this show had, would have opened February 21st. So that's now tentatively rescheduled for the fall. Uh, we should have had okay. a summer show called Somewhere Downtown, which created by Carla McCormick about kind of, you know, 80s New York. Um, that's mm-hmm. now pushed to next year. Okay. We should have had Salfay, a big Salfay retrospective survey in September, which we've pushed to March of next year. Um, okay. So, and then, you know, but because now suddenly we can reopen, which we didn't know about. So, I mean, you, you couldn't really predict so we're sort of faced with this amazing situation of you can reopen, but you don't actually yeah. have a show. So we've gone about generating a, a brand new show um, for, for oh, March wow. 21st, which is called Meditations okay. in an Emergency. Um, a little oh. Frank O'Hara homage. Um, nice. Think, you know, yeah. Um, okay. So that is which, that just being put together by works locally that you have? Yeah, so it's it's um, you know it's it's a couple of things. It's it's Chinese artists who have works locally, and then mm-hmm. there are quite a number of international um, participants as well. Uh, but mm-hmm. we're you know showing them, we're showing videos and other kinds of works that don't mm-hmm. require physical travel. Yeah. We're also right. we also have an Elizabeth Payton show coming. Um, oh. It's scheduled scheduled to open on June twenty sixth. 
it it was at the National Portrait Gallery in London in the fall and should have gone somewhere else in between, but that fell through for non-COVID reasons. Um, so okay. we'll see. It depends a little bit on the lockdown situation in London, whether they can build the crates and you know get the works on the floor yeah. in time. But, um, well, that's so Elizabeth, interesting. You know, th- sorry, go ahead. No, no, just Elizabeth has been extremely um, um, understanding and has actually agreed to let mm-hmm. us install the show remotely, you know, without mm-hmm. her coming because because you know foreigners, foreign right. passport holders can't enter China right now. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting um, question of the museum partnerships because you know you've brought shows from so many institutions and. Um, for those in Europe and the United States or, you know, South American countries that may not be able to physically handle any of this stuff right now, that, I mean, that just the butterfly effect of the inability to even get art around the world like it used to be, um, that's a very interesting kind of logistical question, too. Um, have you, uh, do you feel like it's, it, do you feel like that's going to continue to be something we have to untangle or is that going to be pretty easy to figure out once society gets back to normal. I mean, it's, it's interesting on so many levels how, you know, this dovetails with the larger conversation about climate change and what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, the yeah. art world is always a reflection of the real, or a parody of the real world, as someone once said. Um, and I think um, <laughs> the idea of, of this kind of axiomatic reliance on, on huge amounts of shipping and these major uh-huh. carbon footprints and lots and lots of travel. It's something that was already uh-huh. being questioned. I think of like, uh, you know, Kyle yeah. Benacheca wrote this wonderful piece for freeze that yeah. ran in like, either the January or February issue, just kind of like, do we really yeah. need to be doing this? And that sort of art fair fatigue conversation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, there was a, actually Andras Santo had a really nice op-ed and, uh, I guess it was art at, I think today or yesterday, uh, where one of the points was like, well, maybe this will, you know, force a return to a kind of more considered regionalism. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, for example, the show we're planning under these rather extreme circumstances, that's on one level what what's happening. And I don't think, you know, mm-hmm. international shipping and travel will be cut off entirely, but I think we'll, we'll start mm-hmm. to be more intentional. Um, yeah, I agree. I think people... At least it's top of mind, you know, people are actually thinking about it now, whereas a year ago, two years ago, it was not, uh, it was just the expectation that you go and go and go uh, when these art fairs are happening. And I think the fashion world is saying very much the same things right now. Um, I'm going to be speaking with someone um, from the fashion industry next week who is, you know, an activist in terms of environmental impacts on the fashion world. And I think um, there, there are a lot of parallels to how these two industries are um, going to have to rethink how they, you know, reconnect to, to commerce and audiences um, because, you know, the carbon footprint is insane. And, you know, you can ship a work from Hong Kong to the Armory of New York, and if it doesn't sell, you're shipping it back, you know. And, it, I mean... Nowadays, that it just doesn't make any sense, um, regardless of COVID nineteen. So, um, but yeah. So, are, are there, you know, now that you're kind of emerging out of it, are there any insights or things that you want to impart on us <laughs> out here in in the United States or in Europe, since we're you know about a month in, um, and I, I'm starting to feel normal but only normal in the sense of you know i'm quarantined in my house right so where what can we look forward to over the next few weeks or months um (laughs) i mean nothing (laughs) no i mean i actually really enjoyed i I, we knew we were lucky because the worst of it was kind of when the weather was so terrible too right so it was sort of to be stuck at home in the winter is a slightly different thing than when the you know, the sun is coming out and you should be going mm-hmm. somewhere. No, but um, I, I I don't know, because I, I also, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be so presumptuous to say that we're out of it over here either. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we're kind of, I, I think we're sort of in an eye of the storm sort of situation or, you know, we're going to be indefinitely in a situation where, um, you know, like no one can enter and I could leave but never mm-hmm. come back. You know, as a so so just, wow. I, um, but that's kind of a frightening thought, right? I mean, like something happens yeah. to your family or whatever, like you have your life here. I, it's just, 
Yeah. Um, so, so we're, we're, it, we're not back to normal or anywhere near it, mm. but, um, mm. I don't know, psychologically getting back to something that feels a bit more normal or being busy or being not just busy, but being able to do, you know, the work that we, well, I mean, you're, you're able to go to your with. office. Yeah. That's you know, you're true. able to go yeah. to office. Right. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, I, I work from home, but I also commute a lot between New York and Boston. I don't know when I'm going to go to New York again in the near future. Um, but you know, the fact that I can even set a time on my schedule for when that next trip will be, that'll be kind of a luxury, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think of you being able to go to an office right now is just a huge step in the next direction for us. Yeah, so. no, it definitely is. No, but I mean, so like we're opening a show in, we have a second location uh, by the beach in, yeah. um, in Beidaiho, which is the, you know, the sort of beach town that goes with Beijing. And uh, we're opening a show there on, on, <laughs> April 25th. Now the, the sort of community okay. where, where this beautiful award-winning building is, yeah. um, is still not totally reopened, but we thought it was important to just get a show up and have it there. So we're yeah. doing a, you know, a virtual opening. And I, I hadn't really processed until about a week ago, like what that meant. I was thought, Oh, so we'll go. Mm. And, you know, there won't be that many people. And they're like, no, 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 no one's going. You know, in fact, like uh -huh. the, the curator, uh, a few a few of our tech team and a few of the artists are there now. They're going to finish uh -huh. the install, you know, four days before the opening. They're going to film it and do like a VR tour of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we're and then on the day when the show would have opened, we're going to post all of that. And right. there aren't going to be any human visitors to the show for at least a couple more weeks. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. Very interesting. Well, I mean, I, I think all of this, you know, we could talk to you about this for a long time. And um, I think we have a lot of lessons, or well, not lessons, but just, you know, things to, to observe from what you guys are doing um, here in the U.S. And, you know, and also one of the things about China is just everyone is connected on WeChat. And, you know, I mean, your life kind of runs on your device um, even before COVID-19. Right. And so now in uh, in kind of the western societies where like we were on our phones a lot but i wasn't always paying with my phone i wasn't entering buildings with my phone um but you know we're kind of we're even more connected to our devices now than we were in the past which is good and bad um so we have three minutes left which is crazy um do, if anyone has questions for phil put it in put it in put it in quick so we can get him on to uh to address any questions um and uh i'm just so grateful that we got to spend the time together and connect again so um are you are you like off to bed soon are you having a little nightcap yeah no i'm uh, you know it's it's uh got my Barbaresco. Um, uh, nice. Just uh, gonna, I don't know, I'm gonna, I have, to, I have a text that's a little bit overdue, so I'm gonna work on that. Yeah, um, yeah, very cool. Um, I can't believe, no one has questions, or at least I'm not seeing any. All right, oh, yeah. All right, I guess we've learned, Phil is just so wise, we've learned everything that he's needed to tell us. <laughs> Well, I hope you get to come get out of Beijing and come back to the States at some point soon. And, you know, we can see each other. Oh, yeah. What is your COVID reading list? Oh, that's from Paula. Um, I, so, I, you know, this is a morbid one because he was one of the uh, he, 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 we lost him to COVID. But I just finally read um, Aaron Sorkin's uh, 20 Minutes in Manhattan. Not Aaron Sorkin, sorry, wow. Michael Sorkin. Oh, I was um, like, I just, didn't realize. Yeah, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Michael Sorkin, um, the architect and urban planner. It was this really beautiful book about basically walking from um, from uh, from his house to his office um, from basically Washington mm -hmm. Square to Tribeca. And it's like a whole mm -hmm. meditation on Jane Jacobs and all of these things. Yeah. Um, Alex Ross, The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century. It's like one of those ones that yeah. you sort of get 100 pages into and put nice. aside. Likewise, Mary Beard, SPQR, um, little, little Roman history. Um, yeah. Celine. Are you Celine looking at your bookshelf right night. now? I, ha I have a special, actually, yeah, I have a special, um, you know, square that's just the books that I've read during nice. the epidemic. So Nice. Cool. Uh, yeah, Yoey asked, 
Uh, why do you think museums are furloughing their education staff during the epidemic? Um, well, I mean, you know, I think we haven't done that, certainly. Um, I think in, in a place like New York, where you have huge numbers of, um, you know, freelance staff of all different kinds or kind of contract staff that are doing, uh, that are actually doing the educating of, say, like school groups, and then the schools are closed and the museums closed, uh, it probably is a challenge to the way the the budgets yeah. are built, not to defend it, but that, that seems to be, right. I think there've been a lot of um, yeah, contract staff that have really take, hit, take, take, taken the brunt of yeah. the museum layoffs so far for all those. Well, I, I think a lot of like, front I mean, desk people too, you know, visitor experience yeah. and security and these other functions. Right, right. I mean, let's hope it's, it's a furlough and not something more permanent, but it's interesting that, um, you know, you're the, fourth person I've talked to on this chat and I, that a similar question like that has come up from someone in every single chat um, that, you know, the question of why educate, why is education the expendable one in a lot of these furloughs? And, and it's not something that, you know, if you, your institution has not done that. Um, but I think it also has a lot to do with the structure of, you know, how um, the American system it you know structures employment and um you know like you were saying with you know if you're a 1099 and you're a docent or you're you know an educator who goes in once or twice a week um or you are you know a member of it i don't know i mean it's it's very complicated but it, it is hard because you know your mission is to educate the public as a museum yeah. um all right phil tenari thank you so much um Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, yeah, and have a great night. And thank you, everybody. I'll be back on at 12 o'clock, 12.30. Oh, I can't even remember. Check my Instagram with Duke Riley. He's still, he's still asleep, and I guess I still kind of am too. Um, and I am going to, this will be up on the stores for 24 hours, um, and then uh, IGTV or YouTube, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. So thank you, everybody, and goodbye, Phil.